Hey guys, welcome back to the tea room. This is part two of my life update. If you watched the first video, then you've gotten halfway through um, this update. And I want to apologize that I had to cut it and take it down and re-upload and, you know, rework some things. But I did not realize that my audio had cut off um, while I was talking. And you couldn't hear the whole second half of the video. So I had to come, you know, come back on here, re-upload it, and then... I'm now recording, re-recording the second half of my update. So hang in there with me, guys. I'm getting back into the swing of things. Before I go any further, let me remind you, click that subscribe button. You know you want to. It doesn't cost you anything, and you never know. I just might be your flavor of the month. Um, and also hit that notification bell so that you can be aware of when I upload next. And also, don't forget to thumbs up, okay? And leave a comment in the comment section below. I have missed you guys. I want to catch up with you guys and all that good stuff. Okay, so where we left off on the first video was that I was telling you that I had, I went and peed on all, almost all of those pregnancy tests that I had and they all came back positive. And so the next thing I did was call my doctor um, and they wanted me to come in for a blood test. I was a ball of nerves because I didn't know if I wanted it to be positive, but at the same time, I, I wouldn't say I didn't want it to be positive, but I wasn't sure how I was going to respond to a confirmed pregnancy coming on the heels of a miscarriage. It was going to be a mixed bag of emotions, and it certainly was. So I go in, I do the blood test. I had to wait three days for those test results to come back. Um, to confirm the pregnancy. So the three days go by and they call me back. The doctor calls me back with the results and she goes, well, I don't want you to get your hopes up, but it looks like you might be pregnant. Your numbers have to be 25 or higher to be pregnant. You're at 24. Really? So here is where we insert our trust walk with the Lord because if you have experienced pregnancy loss, if you have experienced any type of trauma, if you have experienced the loss of a loved one, there is a very good chance that you might be mad at God. You might be looking at God with major side eye like, really God? Like, this is what this is what it's going to be? Um, you are the creator of all heaven and earth and you saw all the days of my life and you saw this coming and you 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 couldn't intervene you couldn't you know cut this part of my story out like I was yeah so when you're learning to trust God again and he answers your prayer in a way that you did not expect for him to answer and especially after he shows up after a storm you're a little bit your faith is shaken, your trust is broken, and you kind of have to work your way back to trusting the Lord. And that's exactly what I had to do. I had to start over with God. And I had to start over with God with this new pregnancy, our rainbow baby. And it was not easy. And when I say the lesson started immediately because I'm at a 24, you need to be at a 25. So now I'm like, okay, God, so you're just going to like let them be playing with my emotions. I'm at a 24. I need to be at 25. Now I got, I, I done already waited three days. Now I got to wait another, you know, day or so, or another week to see if it's going to go up from the 24 to anything else. Okay, so that was the longest week of my life. I go back in for another test and lo and behold, we went from a 24 to like now we are like 150 something and they're like, congratulations, you're pregnant. Drop the confetti and then clutch your pearls because now the realization hit me after the initial joy and excitement wore off, what really hit me next was trepidation because now I know what I know and I can't unknow 
what I know, which is that sometimes babies don't make it. Sometimes babies die for no reason. And now I'm having to trust God that it's not going to happen again. And that for me, I enjoyed this last pregnancy, but it was a very hard pregnancy, even though it was as normal as normal could be. The only issue that I had with Noelle being pregnant with her is that I had hypertension. And so they had to watch me closely. I did not have a subchorionic hemorrhage again. You know, she implanted perfectly. My placenta was in the right place. There was nothing wrong. And I would like to add also, there was never anything wrong with Nathaniel. Nathaniel was 100% a healthy child. We did our nippet testing. He had no birth defects. He had, there was nothing wrong with my baby, except for that I had a subchorionic hemorrhage. And usually, my doctors were telling me that usually those resolve themselves and you can continue on with a very healthy pregnancy. That was not the case for me. So the devastation that I felt knowing that this was not something that was supposed to take my child's life, this was not su something that was supposed to end with my child not being with me was very devastating and hard for me to go through. And so here I am pregnant with Noel, and I'm just begging God literally every day and sometimes mom every moment of the day, please watch over her, please protect her, and please spare me that devastating heartache because I don't want to go through that again. I barely made it through Nathaniel, and I knew that if it happened again, I wasn't so sure that I could make it through another loss. Like, I'm just real talk. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, this, this pregnancy was more about me learning to trust God again. And let me just say, you know, God is amazing. If I didn't know it before, I certainly know it now because what I had to relearn about God, I had to unlearn some things about God, but I, and, and I had to learn some new things about God. And one of the things that I learned about God is that he is so full of grace and mercy and patience and tenderness and he waits on us. He will wait on you to get to the place where you need to be, where you can receive him. When God sees that you're in a rough patch, when he sees that, you know, you are really wrestling with some things you know, there's that tender side of God that just, I don't really know how to put it into words, but he just waits. He waits on you so lovingly and so patiently. And that's what he did for me in that moment and throughout the pregnancy, throughout my grief journey. Um, there were moments where I was just I could spit fire. I was so mad at God. I couldn't listen to worship music. I couldn't pray. I didn't know what to pray. I ran out of prayers. All I could do was cry. I would open my mouth to pray. And the only thing that fell from my body was tears. And there is, there is, a certain point in your walk with Christ where you come to that defining moment and that decision where you're wrestling and you are wrestling some big heavy things and you have to make the choice. Am I going to believe what God says? Am I going to believe who God is? Or am I going to walk away? And I want to tell you, that is a very scary place to be as a Christian. Because I started to question everything that I thought I knew about God. And I never thought that I would find myself in a place where I was like, I don't know who you are anymore. I don't, I really don't, do I really know who you are, God? Like, 
how could you let this happen to me? That's the question that I kept asking him. And, you know, you hear the saying, oh, you're not supposed to question God. Uh -uh. Don't even come for me with that. That's not true. If that were the case, open up your Bible. Um, Jesus questioned God a couple of times that I can definitively tell you. He questioned God in the Garden of Gethsemane when he asked God, is there any way for this cup to pass me? Because he realized what he was about to go do. He knew what was going to happen to him and he didn't even do anything. He said, yes, send me father. I will go. I will atone for the sins of the world. But then when it came time for him to do it, the question that he asked was, is there any other way <laughs> that I could not be the one to do this? So he questioned God there. And then he questioned God on the cross when he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? So this idea that we're not supposed to question God, I do not subscribe to that at all. I'm a human being and I was going through some really hard, hard things. And I had a lot of questions. I think the more appropriate thing would be to say, it's not that you shouldn't question God. It's just how you question him. It's your attitude when you're questioning him. You still got to remember who you're talking to. OK, you're not just talking to your friend, you're talking to God. And so you got to have to kind of like keep that in mind, even in the midst of being angry with God. And I would also like to say here that, you know, feeling anger, the Bible says, be angry and sin not. And I was very angry and I had cause to be angry. But one of the things that I came to know about God is that he can handle my anger. He could handle my questioning because that's all that I had. You know, he could handle my, and it's a form of seeking. When you ask God questions, it is a form of seeking. He said, seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door will be answered. Well, I had a lot of questions at that moment and I needed him to answer me. I needed him to show up for me. But the thing was, is that, my grief was so heavy that it would not allow me to hear God. I couldn't hear God through my grief. I couldn't hear him through the sadness. I couldn't hear him through the doubts in my mind. I couldn't hear him through my anger. And what I want to say is God knew that. He already saw that in my timeline of the span of my life when he made me. He saw the, these horrible days coming for me and he waited for me he waited on me he waited for me to process the anger and there were days when all i could pray was lord please don't leave me i know that it it looks like i have left you it feels like i've turned my back against you i don't know what else to do but i also know that i can't get through this moment without you so even though i can't find you I hope my audio hasn't cut out. Even though I can't find you, Lord, please come and find me. Come and find me. And that's exactly what he did. He came and he found me in the darkness and he rescued me and he redeemed me. Not through giving me a rainbow baby. No, but in showing me how much he loved me, that he would be willing to wait for me to get through the noise of my anger to where I could hear him again and he could minister to my heart and heal the areas in me that were broken and hurting. And so fast forward to December 12th and I'm about to give birth to my daughter and that my text, my pregnancy was a textbook pregnancy, but my recovery was not as textbook as I would have liked it to be because preeclampsia hit. And then six days postpartum, I find myself again needing to trust God because I had to go back into the hospital in the middle of a pandemic without my newborn because my blood pressure was going through the roof. Now, if I didn't feel like I had to trust him before, I really feel like I need to, I need to trust him right now because my blood pressure was 200 over 100 and something and they were pushing medication in me and my blood pressure was not moving and it got to the point where i started to cry and they told me no you can't cry you cannot 
get upset because you could have a stroke at any moment and <laughs> spending a whole weekend in a hospital looking at this blood pressure monitor and needing for my numbers to come down and not having my husband or anyone there to support me. It was just me, my nurses, and God. You talk about trust. You talk about testing of a faith. <laughs> you talk about draw, draw ye nearer to the, to the Lord. Draw ye, okay, unto God. Yeah, I was never more close to God than in those moments. But again, it stretched my faith. It taught me that apart from God, I cannot do anything. I could not will myself to get better any more than I could have willed my son to come back to me. And Lord knows I tried. Yes, I laid hands on my belly. I spoke life. I, you know, if I could have went inside my own womb and performed CPR on my son, I would have done that. But that was not what God's will was for me. And it took me a very long, long, long 12 months to get to the point where I could say that sentence without feeling anger towards God, without the questioning that I had towards God as to why he would allow this to happen to me. And I want to also say he did answer me. He answered every single question that I had. I'm not going to share it in this video. I will share, save that for another video and, and share that testimony with you. But he did answer me. There was a purpose. My son had a purpose in my life and he fulfilled it. And that's all that I'm going to say about that. So, here I am now. I have this beautiful four month, almost four month old baby girl. She'll be four months on Monday. And I look at her and, and I'm in awe every day. I'm in absolute awe when I look at that child and I see where I'm coming from to where I am now. And I, all I can say is thank you, Jesus. That all I can say is thank you, Jesus. You remembered me. You did not forget me. You did not leave me. You did not forsake me. And Noel does not replace my son. I believe I said that in the first video. There's nothing that could ever replace Nathaniel. Nathaniel is Nathaniel and Noel is Noel. But to see the redeeming grace and the redeeming power of the Lord when he restores you after you have lost a thing. When he restores you after you have been through hell and back. When the scriptures say you will walk through the fire and you won't get burned. I've been there. You will go through the waters and they will not overtake you. I've been there. Right? <laughs> you guys. If I didn't know God was real before, I certainly know he's real now. Um, and it's not to say that I won't ever find myself again in a place where I am questioning God and my faith is wavering. But it is possible for you to, for your faith to be shaken. Absolutely. We are human and we're living in a world that is not our home. And people always ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Because this is not our home. Because since the fall of man, we are subject to imperfection. We are subject to death and life and good things and bad things. Because Christ, said, if you're going to take up your cross and follow me, you're going to, you, you're going to suffer like I suffer. He never said that we were going to make it through this life unscathed here on this side of life. No, he said, if you're going to follow me, you're going to suffer some things. Miscarriage is a part of suffering. Death is a part of suffering. Loss is a part of suffering. 
And it's something that I never thought that I would find myself in. It's something that I honestly had always been afraid of. I always had compassion for women who had lost children. And I would pray, God, please don't ever let me have that happen to me because I don't know what I would do. Um, and, and it happened. And I, I did almost lose my mind, um, almost. But by the grace of God and but for the grace of God, there I go. And I am still here. And it's only because of God's love. It's only because he put people in my circle that were praying for me, that were covering me, that knew my mental state, that knew the severity of and the depth of despair that I was in. And when I could not hold hope for myself, they held hope for me. And that is why community and the right community is so important because when you do get hit by life and it's going to hit you, you're going to need certain people around you that can gird you up, that can lift you up, that can say, you know what? Give me that hope. I'll hold on to that for you until you're strong enough to hold it yourself. And I think that this is a good place for me to end. But before I end, I just want to say, if that person is you, if you're watching this video tonight or whenever you're watching it and you feel like you have reached the end of your rope, say something, go and get help. Okay. There is help available to you. Go get help. Tell somebody that is caring and loves you and is, is, you know, for you and in your corner and never be ashamed to get help. Never be ashamed to admit that you need medication. I was on medication for a year plus and I'm just now weaning off of my medication because I'm in a better place and it was never meant for me to be on it long term. But go speak to your doctor. They will know exactly how to help you and where to direct you to go get help. Do not try to wait it out. Do not try to think that it, it, you can do it by yourself. There's no shame in admitting that you need help. There are trained professionals ready and willing and available to help you get through this moment. And I also want to tell you, you're going to make it. I know it doesn't feel like it right now. I know that right now it feels overwhelming. I know you probably might be feeling like I did, like you want to come out of your skin, that you just want to run away from everything, or let's just be real, that you would be better off not here. That's a lie from the pit of hell. I want to tell you that right now. No, as long as you have breath in your body, God is not done with you yet. He's not finished. This is not going to be the end of you. You have purpose. You have destiny. Whether you see it right now or not, whether you believe it right now or not, hold on. Hold on just a little while longer. Reach out. Go get professional help. Okay? Go and get the help. There are people that can help you through this and they understand they have been trained. They know how to help you. They know what medications you will need. And there's no shame and no condemnation in admitting that you need that. Absolutely none. If I did not get the help that I needed, I would not be here making this video. So I hope that my update has blessed you.